Um, this is a 66-year-old gentleman who came into the emergency department with back and hip pain. He says his legs have been swelling for three weeks. Now with worsening hip and back pain for a week, he needs a walker to ambulate. Um, the pain is constant, severe, near debilitating. Um, normal bowel and bladder habits uh, without any infectious symptoms or sick contact. Urinating more frequently, but with incomplete emptying. And then um, we asked a little bit more about like this difficulty walking. So he, and this is um, one of the places that it, it, I think is a really interesting part of the story. He hasn't had any recent falls, no recent trauma. Um, but he said, and he says, um, he always has walked strange because he has, he broke both legs when he was 12. Um, and, but now, um, whereas he used to be able to get around okay, he simply cannot, like, get his legs to move and carry him without using the locker. How did he break both legs? Uh, excellent question. Um, so this is something that he, we got a slightly different story and looking back through the chart, almost everyone who kind of asked him about it, we got a different explanation. Um, but it sounds like um, he grew up in a somewhat rural setting. And it's very, um, the, the story fluctuates wildly from I fell down a flight of stairs I was working on a farm and working on a farm and like fell off a horse. But I never got took and taken to a doctor. Um, and and there there is like it, it may have been child abuse of some kind. There's like a flavor of that. But again, it was 44 years ago. Um, and and he was never completely upfront about it and never like overly concerned about it. Has he had any lower extremity symptoms? He does have some chronic leg pain, um, but that has not changed until a week ago. It hadn't changed for decades. Was well controlled with over-the-counter Tylenol or ibuprofen, um, and no symptoms or falls on a regular basis. And didn't usually use a walker. Any other fractures? Yeah, a really great question. What are you starting to think about? Just thinking about if there's some sort of genetic or nutritional issue that causes good size for a woman. Yeah, excellent. Um, especially even in a 12 year old male, like just bilateral hip fractures are not something we, or femur fractures are something we often encounter. Um, and so we did a really careful screening. It sounds like he had um, the only other fracture he had was an elbow fracture when he was um, about mm -hmm. five. Again, like a traumatic fall on the playground, um, but no other fractures. And then also asked about family history of like frequent fractures, things like that, and there was no history. Uh, no, actually he says that he has been gaining weight. Um, he, um, and he blames it on COVID. He says that he used to swim really regularly, um, but hasn't swum at all since COVID started, um, because his gym's been shut down. And he says, I probably don't eat as good. I don't think that applies to here, but we always ask about like, trauma and stuff like that. I've been putting that category in recent procedures, like if we had, you know, a cast where they had, you know, femoral abscess, as we had some kind of like lower abdominal surgery. Um, and then when that's to me another category when it comes like trauma to the yeah. like procedural trauma. And then um, the other thing that is really helpful with like low um, back pain is. First of all, just not make, making sure the upper extremities aren't involved at all, because that may direct you more towards the neck or even the head. And then if it's not the case, um, alleviating and exacerbating factors, just as like think about spinal stenosis, the pain on position, lower extremity pain, if you think about the application from some vascular thing, which is a good thing. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
love this. Dr. John's really getting at kind of narrowing down what it, what might be the source of this back pain um, problem. So in terms of past surgical history and procedures, he's had none ever, um, which I love, but I think it's always really important to think about. I always think about, you know, like the kidney biopsy that comes in with back pain and keeps dropping hemoglobin. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, in terms of upper extremity symptoms, he has none. He has full strength. He even says, like, thank goodness, because um, if I, my arms weren't working well, I wouldn't be able to get around at all because I'm using them so much for the walker. Um, and then, and, and no history of, like, quietation like symptoms um, and no neuropathy or changes in sensation. Did we get any history about like anything that changed in his life three weeks ago? Yeah, um, it's excellent question. He, uh, not yet, but he says like, no, my life is really boring these days. Um, I stay at home with my dog. By the way, I want to get out of here so I can get back to my dog. Can I get to go see my dog? Um, and I see my son usually about once a week. He comes by, um, sometimes helps me things around the house, drops off some groceries. Otherwise, I'm pretty much at home. Um, yeah. Can we ask about the leg sign? Yeah, not yet. Great question. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Getting back to the swelling in his leg. Um, he has never had swelling before. Um, and he, it is in both legs. Um, there really doesn't seem to be a difference from one side to the other as far as he can notice. Um, and then he asked about some heart failure symptoms. Um, so like shortness of breath, chest pain, all those, those good things. Um, he says he has never had any chest pain. Um, either at rest or with activity. So granted, I haven't been that active recently. With that, I have noticed I seem to get short of breath more easily than I used to a year ago. But again, I haven't worked out for a year, so I think it's me just being lazy and getting out of shape. Um, yeah, I think overall, like you, I think we touched on probably all of the most important first-line questions um, for this gentleman. Any other review of symptoms questions we want before we kind of round out history? Any symptoms? Yeah. Um, so he denies any uh, night sweats, no new lumps or bumps anywhere that he's noticed, um, and no fevers or chills. Does the pain wake him up at night? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, he says sometimes. Um, he doesn't sleep great because of his, like, chronic bilateral lower extremity pain. And um, I forgot to touch on the chart failure symptoms, asking if he can sleep flat. He says, well, I haven't slept flat for decades because of my back and my legs. I always have slept propped up, and I haven't needed to do that anymore. Um, he says he's waking up slightly more than he used to at night, um, but he's also, like, already getting up every two hours to pee. Didn't sleep great from the pain. So it's a, it's a, he's not like, oh, I don't sleep at all anymore. I think at some point soon I'd like to maybe start fleshing out the differential. Yeah. I think this uh, yeah. sort of medical cases that have neuro flavors, germ flavors, there's a tendency to be like, I don't know, we're going to call somebody. Um, and some of these are emergent, especially this. And so I think I'd like to actually, as we start asking these questions, is what are the things you're, you're considering it to be? We'll make sure that we all have a really long list because it's easy to have a short list. Yeah. And I'm just throwing the things up here that we've pretty clearly um, asked about. Yeah. <laughs> you would say that. Other things <laughs> like neurogenic versus like other types of medication. Yeah. I like that. I like that providing some superstructure to it because otherwise we're just going to start naming things that make your back hurt or your legs swell. 
right? And it's, yeah. That's not the long list for wanting. So I like the idea of having some sort of a structure to this. Is, is what are the things? Is it something pushing? Is it something internal? Yeah. And then maybe the endocrinopathy. Which endocrinopathy would cause this? Like, I'm not disagreeing with you. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I was thinking, like, I actually had a patient all that long ago with osteomalacia, and they had, like, a bunch of fractures, mm -hmm. and so you can get these, like, silent fractures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I would also wonder about... And I think it's the note that's secondary to the bone loss. Perfect. It's not really the right age group, but I would also be thinking about, like, other sort of um, arthritis, like ankylosis.
looking for on exam and what exam maneuvers you want to perform. Um, just to be a little targeted since this is kind of a, a, very, a broad differential, but also um, we should be smart about it. Um, so he's afebrile with a temperature of 33. Heart rate um, is irregular and 125. Blood pressure um, is 134 over 81. Um, respiration 22, and he's starting 97% on the neighbor. So generally reassuring, I would say. Um, what exam, or what, yeah, what do you want to do for your physical exam? Yeah. Sounds good. Um, and I'll tell you generally, he's like seated in bed and no apparent distress. Is he very cachectic appearing or in a normal way? No, well developed, well nourished. Um, he, um, first I'll talk about the lower extremity appearance because this was shot striking. So he's in bed and his legs are relatively fixed with ankles crossed. Um, and he says that he's actually like that's that's how his legs are, um, and that was that's how he walks. He kind of has a shuffling gait with like one leg following the other. Um, the right leg crossed over the left leg, and he's that's how it's been since essentially he was 12 years old. Um, and yeah, so that that was like remarkable and caught everyone's attention. He's really not able to like uncross his legs or unbend his knees more than probably 120 degrees. <laughs> um, so that, that does limit the neuro exam a little bit. Um, but I will say for his lower extremity, he had full sensation um, and to touch, temperature, and vibration. Um, he was able, he had full strength as best as we could tell. Um, he at least had two plus in every area. Um, however, given some of the kind of contract, contractures and chronic movement limitations, he couldn't always um, overcome resistance. Um, but he didn't think that the strength was any different from what his baseline is lying down necessarily, except for maybe proximally where it was closer to just one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then reflexes, he couldn't necessarily kick his legs, but when you hit, you could see the response in the muscles that seemed appropriate. So he had all these contractures that he was walking through Yeah, well, he can still walk, but he has some contractures like in his knee and hip because those are not very, have not been mobile chronically. Yeah. Pardon? PVR. Yes, we did get a PVR. I um, believe it was uh, five, greater than 500. Um, and then I'll also tell you that he had three plus hitting edema in the bilateral lower extremities, um, up to the hip, no sacral edema, and no body wall edema. Anything else? Uh, his uh, cardiac exam was irregular rate, regular rhythm, good pulses in all extremities. Pulmonary exam was completely unremarkable. Um, abdominal exam, foul sounds times four, soft, non tender, non distended, no masses. Yeah, excellent. Kind of getting at that epidural abscess that we were talking about. Um, and no, no, no spine tenderness, no point tenderness, and no um, MSK tenderness. Are you able to do a straight leg raise? No. No. 
could you get any more range of motion with his lower extremities? We, like, not by ourselves, I'll say that um, PT came and evaluated him and, like, he's able to maneuver himself out of bed and, like, ambulate with the walker, mm -hmm. um, but just can't ambulate him independently, which was the big one. And did he have any facets that he or fungus on his neuron? No, great question. See, what do you think about there? Upper motor neuron, fine, lesion. Yeah, and he did not. Um, the clonus is like clonus is a little difficult just because his ankles are not the most mobile ankles, but um, the best part of it. Do you have any abnormalities of his upper extremities? At all? No, they were completely like five out of five strength, normal reflexes, full range of motion, um, and no deformities, including like where he had that elbow fracture. Uh, uh, no, great question. And he had a, he's a relatively normal habitus, uh, like BMI high 20, 30. So not, you're able to appreciate it. No. So what about for his face? Like any of these are like very horrible. Yeah, a really good question. What are you thinking about there? In your product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and no peri um, periorbital edema. He doesn't, and he doesn't think his face looks puffy. Um, but he says he's like, I really don't look in the mirror. But he says, you see, you you you're seeing what I see, and you can probably understand what I don't. He was not an attractive person, but <laughs> just a, just a sixty year old could have been a mess. Um, <laughs> prostate exam. Excellent. Um, I think this is something that I know as an intern, I actually on overnight admission missed in a case of prostatitis. Um, and infectious prostatitis can have many complications. Um, I will admit, I, until now, I did not think of doing a prostate exam, but I will say it was um, diffusely enlarged symmetrically, um, not, no bogginess and no nodules. Face tone. Normal tone. Um, so I think again, this is like I, I chose this case because it has a lot of a lot of pieces that could go in many different directions. Um, what would you say? Um, since May was sitting close to me, um, I um, what would you say are like the three to five key pieces of information that you pull out of all, all of we have so far to guide your next steps. Oh gosh. Um, let's say it's like the neuro exam is a little bit unusual, but I think I've been like a lot of fine now, you know, or like more discussion. Um, and then it sounds like it's hard to do okay, so I want to look at like other parts of volume overload. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so what labs, what labs do we want and why? BMP. BMP. Okay. Obviously, we're going to get a BMP. Um, but tell me, what specifically are we excited about on this BMP? Like, if you have 10 seconds to scan it before you get called to a code, like, what are the high value pieces of information you're looking for? Do not want to miss. Fat Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? And calcium. Yeah. What do we think of there? Because like he has this weird history of these like atypical fractures, it could it could signal towards like a secondary osteoporosis in the future. Great, I love it. Um, Okay. Okay, what are we thinking now? 
when you're, you've got all of these things that might start pointing you to a nephrotic syndrome, um, where you've got a lot of protein in the urine, swelling in his legs, elevated creatinine, and then your protein creatinine ratio doesn't look right, recognizing that other proteins come out in your urine. Um, and so we're only looking at the albumin. So what do we want to do to try and find out more about kind of what, the pro what protein is coming out in his urine and what is causing this anemia? Electrophoresis. Yeah. Electrophoresis. <laughs>
factors that uh, folks are presented with are the fatigue, weakness, weight loss, paresthesia, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, or pleural effusion. The pleural effusions and other pulmonary uh, manifestations are usually late in the disease course due to um, osmocytomas. Um, and about 7% of patients present with extra medullary plasma cytomas at diagnosis, which is a poor prognostic factor. Um, increasingly, people are diagnosed with a multiple myeloma on kind of a screening CDC when they're found to have a mild macrocytic anemia. Um, so it is having an improved, uh, or I said, decreased mortality. Um, so diagnosis um, is important, and um, it was really important in this gentleman's case as well, because there's kind of three different classifications and ways to diagnose it. Um, you, if you have, the key is a bone marrow biopsy, and in this gentleman's case, he got the bone marrow biopsy, and if you have greater than 60% of plasma cells on any specimen of the bone marrow biopsy, it's diagnostic of multiple myeloma, regardless of presence or absence or other, other features. Um, in that, but in the next tier, if you have 10 to 60% plasma cells, um, you need organ tissue impairment or evidence of biomarker of multiple myeloma, so elevated kappa lambda, or confirmed plasma cytoma. And then if you have less than 10% plasma cells, you need an organ tissue impairment biomarker and a bony plasma cytoma. Um, so the fewer plasma cells, the more other criteria you need to meet. Um, but ideally, if you can get a bone marrow biopsy with greater than 60% uh, plasma cells, it's diagnostic. Um, and then talking about treatment, certainly not something we're going to manage independently, but just recognizing the gold standard of treatment is an autologous condition hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, interestingly, in reading about this, um, having only practiced in the United States, I did not appreciate that most other countries are much more stringent with their qualifications for hematopoietic stem cell transplants, and actually no one over the age of 65 qualifies regardless of functional status of comorbidities. However, um, in the United States, the only absolute exclusion criteria um, for the stem cell transplant are being over 77, having cirrhosis, an ECOG status of less than three or four, and heart failure class three or four. Um, and so really we're far more liberal with that. And it's interesting, there isn't obviously no comparison data for that 65 to 77 um, age group, but the mortality um, in the age group that transplanted above that age that doesn't meet these exclusion criteria, isn't substantially worse than mortality in other countries where they only transplant under 65. Um, and then all folks are gonna go through either in, through induction chemotherapy, um, VRD or DVD, just with lenalidomide or daratumumab, um, depending, and then that's where the course is very widely and additional therapy depends on if you're induction leading into a stem cell transplant or maintenance following a stem cell transplant. Um, overall, the prognosis is mediocre um, for multiple myeloma. Um, median survival is between about two to five years, depending on stage of diagnosis, um, but longer than many of the leukemias and lymphomas. Um, it's the, um, it's kind of the longest survived of a true malignancy um, compared to like MGUT or smoldering myeloma that have kind of unclear prognosis. Um, and then it's always important um, for these folks to get a fish to um, identify the high risk features. Um, and those are things that can be done in clinic or during hospitalization to kind of better tee them up for oncology. Um, What's the difference between MGUT and smoldering MGUT? That is a great question. I wrote that down <laughs> um, because there is a slight difference. So MGUS has a serum monoclonal protein of less than 30 grams per day um, with bone marrow plasma cells of less than 10%. Um, moldering myeloma has a monoclonal protein of greater than 30 grams per day with 10 to 60% plasma cells and no evidence of end organ damage or biomarkers. So it's essentially MGUS, smoldering, multiple, and if on the spectrum. Good question. Nice job, guys.
Um, I think this is a yeah, it's a good case because sometimes like as soon as you get um, some labs, you know a lot more information about a patient who is very undifferentiated. Great job. Thank you. What's going on? Oh, a lot. Yeah. Make you help her do the next slide.